I want to thank God for the safe travel that each of you have experienced in coming here. And I know that there are some others that are on their way. We're looking forward to a great weekend together. I want to mention just a few housekeeping items. One, in case you should be looking. If you're looking for a restroom, you will step out these doors, and they are to the left. There are two sets, uh, the main ones that are directly at the end of the hall, and then uh, uh, individual ones, uh, men and women, to the right, down a little hallway there. Um, looking a little bit further than tomorrow at 9, at 10 o'clock, there will be a combined A and B section with Elizabeth Fisher, a guest coming to us from Florida, and she's going to be talking about one way we can touch our community through compassion. You'll be learning more about that in just a little bit. Uh, and Jorge Meyer will be sharing about God's dream for his church in section C. Um, also at, at the nine o'clock meeting, Roger will be having a, a seminar in the Hispanic uh, language track. Uh, that's at nine. Let me just mention, I hope each of you have registered. I see a lot of white tags. That's a good thing. That, that is your pass to get in. Uh, those who registered have access to the room, and if you will take that and look on the back side, there is a little red ticket. That's your meal ticket for lunch. Um, we, uh, as Glenn mentioned, we have been wonderfully overwhelmed by the number of people who wanted to come. We are limited by our elbow room and the fire, fire code, so we are wanting to respect that. And for that reason, we're attempting to record the seminars and, and make them available uh, through, through um, CDs. If you are staying at the hotel, please park there and leave your car and come across that will leave room for those who are driving in, and as there is limited parking in this facility right here. Those of you who were, have asked questions about breakfast, you can, there, there is a restaurant in the, in the hotel, and you can have that added to your, uh, to your hotel bill, is my understanding. I want to encourage you as you are here remember you are serving a gracious savior he has been most gracious with you be gracious with those who are caring for your needs show god's generosity and may i may i suggest that as you leave something uh, for the maid tomorrow Write a note, Happy Sabbath. Someone shared that suggestion. I think it's a wonderful suggestion. Let God's generosity shine through you. Before we have our prayer for the evening, this meeting, I want to mention someone for whom evangelism is extremely important. Many of you, most of you, know Dale and Myrna Pollitt. Myrna has been in the hospital and is, it has been in ICU, is struggling with a situation that look, it looks as if God is the only healer who can provide the effective healing needed. We want to remember her in prayer as, as we begin this meeting. She and her husband have been all over these two states leading people to Jesus Christ. And we would want to remember them especially at our evangelism impact. Join me in prayer as we bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we delight to come together in your name. We wouldn't dare to do so and it and attempt to talk about evangelism without asking your presence by your Holy Spirit. His work in our life is essential. No matter what we learn, no, no matter 
what experiences we hear unless you are here by your spirit, Lord, to guide in the speaking and in the hearing, we are wasting time. And so we humbly plead that you will bless this meeting. As we are gathered here, speak to our hearts. Press out our selfishness. Burn out our complacency. Fill us with a love for those who are around us who need to know this life-giving message for eternity, not just for time. May your glory, that is your character, be pressed into us by your spirit, by your presence. so that others will want to know what gives us hope, what gladdens our lives and makes them meaningful. We pray for your blessing upon Roger as he speaks to us. Burn in his heart a message for us in Jesus' precious name. And Lord, we would not forget our dear friend Myrna. She's not right here, but she is in your care. And we lift her up before your throne, asking for your work in her life. Touch her and make her whole, we pray, according to your marvelous grace. In the name of our mighty Savior, the great physician, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation, Glenn and Haskell. It's my pleasure to be here. I want to share with you what's in the heart of God. I want to talk to you from a practitioner's point of view. I don't read about evangelism. I do evangelism. I, I do six evangelistic series every year something we're involved in as a family. So I see lost people coming to Christ every month. And there's no greater high, and I used to get high, than seeing somebody come to Christ. So I want to talk to you from my heart about some things that I think need to improve if we're going to be able to reach this generation. I was invited by a congregation that said with their invitation, please come and help us because our church is dying. There's only 25 of us left. And we don't understand why we're dwindling down in numbers. So if you can provide some instruction for us, Help us because we want to reach our community for Christ. There are no major problems in our, um, in our church. We, we pretty much get along with each other. But we don't understand why it is there's only 25 of us left. The church that fits 150. So I was there on Friday night. And most of the 25 showed up. And then on Sabbath morning, all of the 25 showed up. And I asked 
a young adult without them knowing I said this is what I want you to do I want to I want you to show up at this address and don't say you know me just show up as if you were a guest okay wear the most heathen clothing you can find that was that wasn't really hard for her right <laughs> and just show up and then I'm going to give you a form that you can fill out at the end about your experience. You, you've heard about mystery shoppers. Okay? This is a mystery church guest. So she shows up, okay, and sits down. Now, this is 150 capacity. There's 25 people there. And she sits down. There's nobody at the door to greet her. She sits down by herself. And nobody approaches her. In fact, well, well I'm lying. There, there's one person that approaches her, and it's the weird guy. Because <laughs> every church has a weird guy, right? Right? If you can't think about it, it's you. <laughs> it's you. This is you we're talking about. It's the weird guy approaches her and says hi and leaves. And there she is by herself. And I get up to preach. And I'm preaching this message that I'm about to preach right now. And I'm saying to them, it would be for a guest to come here. And for you guys not to embrace them and love them. And everybody said... Amen. I mean, it would be downright sinful that God will bring somebody here you don't know and you would fail to embrace them and help them and love them. In fact, if God sent somebody here and nobody sat next to them, it would be a sin. Preach it. Preach it. Amen. And I'm looking at her, sitting down by herself. At the end of, of uh, the message, we went down to eat. The problem is not that we're not friendly. The problem is that we're friendly with ourselves. And I want to share with you one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. It's the story of the prodigal son. And from that story, today and tomorrow night, I want to share with you some practical things you can do to make sure your church is a place that the ones who God misses the most can feel loved, engaged, and connected. Let's read the first part of that chapter. By the way, that's my... Twitter handle, so you're under 40, you know what that means. <laughs> this is, this is the, the introduction, the three stories in that chapter. You, you're familiar with them, you've read them. The three stories, a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. But before the stories, Luke, who's the doctor, introduces the reason for the stories with the following passage. It said, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often, everybody say often, often, often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. Notice that the criticism about Jesus was not about the fact that he had another woman, that he was a heavy drinker, the fact that he smoked or cursed. The problem with Jesus, according to the Pharisees, were his associations. For some reasons, sinners felt comfortable in the presence of a sinless God. Interesting. 
So after these introductions, Jesus tells them the three stories. And the third story, the story of the prodigal son, let's get from that story three principles today, three principles tomorrow. Number one, first principle you get from the prodigal son story is that you can't force people to come to church, but you can be ready when they come. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I cannot force people to come. This is not communism. That's the reason why I left Cuba. I can't put a gun to your head and take you to church. I can't force people. I can invite people. But I can be ready when they come. Notice the passage. And I want you to catch two principles in this passage. One is intentionality, and the other one is excellence. Let's read. So he returned home to his father. This is the prodigal son. And while he was still a long way off, there's a sermon just in that passage, just that phrase, still a long way off. How many long way off people do you have attending your congregation? His father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his fingers and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. Two words. Excellence and intentionality. In that passage, you see the father. He wasn't caught up by surprise that his son had returned home. He didn't say, oh, what? you're here? What do we do now? The Bible says that all the preparation had been made. The ring had been bought. The sandals were in the house. The calf had been fattened. The feast had been prepared. Excellence and intentionality. The father did not know when his son was going to come back. But he knew eventually he was. So when that day would arrive, he wanted to be ready. The question I am asking you today is, is your church a church that has excellence and intentionality in it. I don't know why, but from all major organizations and businesses, I don't know why the church tolerates mediocrity. Not only tolerates it, but enhances it and approves it. And we're the church. This is not Marriott. This is not Burger King. This is the church of the living God. And we tolerate mediocrity. We reward it. Somebody wants to sing, can't sing, worth the lick, but wants to sing. I want to sing, 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 I want to sing. And there's always somebody, because those people always find somebody with them. And they tell them, Pastor, let him sing. And they use these two phrases. Let him sing because he's spiritual. And he's sincere. Now let me ask you, in what other areas of your life do you allow those two things to happen? For example, would you get operated by a doctor who did not know how to operate, but he was a spiritual doctor <laughs> and very sincere? Would you allow yourself to go to a mechanic who did not, knew nothing about cars? Then no, I don't know nothing about Fords and Toyotas and Chevys. I don't know about Beamers. I have no idea. While these cars function, but I am very sincere, and I pray every day. You wouldn't go 
to eat at a restaurant where the chef cannot cook, had not gone to culinary school, but he was very sincere and he was very spiritual. We don't allow it anywhere else except for church. He's sincere. And this, this is what I'm saying. In this story, you see the two words, excellence and intentionality. The two principles happening there. The father said, I want to give him the best robe. I want to do the biggest feast. I don't want to pick from any of the cattle. I want to have something that has been fattened. It's intentional. It's on purpose. We don't start when people get there and finish when it's over. We start on time and finish on time. Excellence and intentionality. We don't get up to the pulpit and say whatever. We don't teach our Sabbath school studying that Saturday morning. We prepare in advance because what we're trying to do is get people closer to Jesus. And excellence honors God and inspires people. So this is what I'm saying to you. You don't have to have a Hollywood production to have something that is excellent. Here's some practical advice. Number one, when you get in the pulpit, be positive. Smile at people. Been in too many churches. Get up. Sabbath school director gets up and says, I don't know why nobody's here. And starts just going on, railing on the people there. The ones that need to be listening to the correction are sleeping. <laughs> the, one, the ones that are at church should be encouraged. Okay? Excellence and intentionality. It would be nice if your bathrooms didn't stink. It would be nice if the name of the pastor in your sign was actually the pastor. <laughs> Not the one that was there three pastors ago. And your sign wasn't covered by brush. It would be nice with a fresh coat of paint. It would be nice if the windows weren't drafty. It would be nice see, when you get up to talk, say things that make sense to normal people. Don't use Adventese because church is not for me. Church is for the one God misses the most. So I'm going to try to use a language they understand. When you start using words like GC and ABC, they have no idea what that means. And by the way, please cut down on the announcements. Nobody goes to church to hear announcements. Nobody gets up in the morning on Sabbath and say, I wish there were more announcements. <laughs> People come to church to encounter God, not to listen about the next pop fine or car wash. You have to have in your mind, okay, what prodigal is God sending to me today? What prodigal is returning to church after a while? Who that is far from God has arrived? Say stuff that makes sense. Please, God. People start praying, praying like this, and I'm like, what does that even mean? Please, God, help the ones that are on the way. To, it's like a phrase they use. They could hear, get here faster. It's like, they, they, it's, how, how hasten the steps of the ones that are on the way? Have you heard that? What does that even mean? What does that even mean? When you're praying that prayer, does God give people turbos? Okay. What, what, that, what does that even mean? Speak in English. Smile at people. Greet people. I believe it is a sin for somebody to get to our church who's a guest and for that person not to be engaged in conversation and welcome and loved for them to sit by themselves and go home by themselves, people will put up with almost everything if they're in a, friend, in a place that they feel it's friendly towards them. Excellence 
and intentionality. Number two, I don't know why my, my screen's not working, but I'm going to try. Okay. Number two. Second thing about the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son that we need to understand if we're going to be people that are intentional in reaching the ones God misses the most. The second one from the story is that acceptance precedes transformation. When the son came back home, the father did not greet him with an I told you so. He greeted him with I love you so. And in fact, the father had all the reason in the world to tell him, I told you so. Chapter 15, verse 20. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Acceptance precedes transformation. In order for the good news to be good news to other people, they first have to be good news for you. So when you go to church, smile. It's okay. There's some people that I think have been baptized in vinegar. It's like <laughs> they're upset, they're mad, they're looking at they're, they're, they're looking at, 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 at okay, this, there's always somebody, and every time that I preach, there's always somebody that gives me a little note at the end about mistakes of my grammar. Number one, English is not my first language. And number two, please don't. <laughs> Acceptance precedes transformation. There is no obedience without deliverance. If, I, a, a, if you look at the Bible as a list of do's and don'ts, if you look at the Bible as a set of I ought to, I have to, you must, you're missing the point. It's a relationship with Christ. So my job is not to point at your mini skirt. My job is to point you to Jesus so he can help you with your mini skirts. My job is not to tell you that eating cheese is a sin. By the way, I'm a vegetarian. I like my lifestyle. I believe it makes me healthier, but it doesn't make me holier. And I believe vegetarianism should be explained, but not enforced. You should be advocates of vegetarianism by your happy disposition. How many happy vegetarians do you know? <laughs> Walking around telling people what they don't, I don't eat that, I don't eat that. Nobody asks you, dude. I have two friends, both of them, both of them are vegans. And you have your militant vegans and you have your like really good vegans. So I have, I have, I have two friends, both of them are vegans. And my, this one guy, he, he, he got, all of a sudden, you've ever met somebody, all of a sudden understands like the whole thing and just becomes so, I, I, I get it. Because, you know, it was, I was, so was I at one point. And, and he's so enthusiastic about this new and the weight loss and the, the, the changes. He's so enthusiastic that you can come across as you're trying to shame people into changing. And shame doesn't change people. The gospel changes people. Eh? And, and he, uh, so he comes to my house. And, and we're sitting down to eat, and he's like, 
eliminate that, and you have to eliminate that, and you have to eliminate that, and you have to eliminate that. He said that word so many times, my kids don't know him as water. They know him as eliminate. <laughs> Is eliminate going to come? Let me tell you something. I, I, said, I said to myself, it, 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 if that's what that's going to do to me, I don't want that. I have another friend who's also vegan. He never pushed veganism on me. He never said, you have to do it or you won't go to heaven. He didn't inspect my food. All he did was take me to some awesome vegan restaurants. And he had a, he just, we just ate vegan food. I'm like, this is good stuff. And all of a sudden, I started changing make uh, change in my diet, not because it was pushed on me, but because somebody, instead of enforcing it, explained it by his life. I saw people losing weight. I saw people sleeping more. Well, I, I want to have a healthier lifestyle. My job as a follower of Christ is not to clean the fish. It's just to fish the fish. It's not to say, well, this fish is not can come in the bowl. This is not, it's fish. I mean, every church says we want to reach lost people. Every church. I've never been in a church that says, yeah, we hate lost people. We don't want them here. <laughs> every church says we want to reach lost people. The question you have to ask yourself, though, is what level of lostness are you comfortable with? Because we want lost people to look like us. They don't. They smoke and drink and curse and sleep around. But I want my church smelling like tobacco because that means there's people there that are far from Christ that need uh, the best way and the best place they can come and be saved is inside the church. I don't want them to get cleaned up to come. I want them to come because God can clean them up. If you're asking people to have all these changes before they can feel part of you, then what you're training them to be are legalists. Because it's only the Holy Spirit and the power of Christ that can change a person. And some of you were like that. You remember it? You were waking up on Sunday morning, giving a hug to the toilet because you're vomiting. Some of you were drunks, and some of you were drug addicts, and some of you were sleeping around, being unfaithful to your spouse. Some of you, you knew how you were. You were liars and cheaters, and God redeemed you. Sometimes we get amnesia about where God has brought us from. If God has patience and love for us, let us be doing the same thing for other people. Acceptance precedes transformation. Once a person understands he is perfectly loved See, the gospel is not that God takes a bad man and makes him good. The gospel is that God takes a dead man and makes him alive. We're not into behavioral transformation. We're into character transformation, and that's different. One of my favorite quotes from Ellen White. In Desire of Ages, page 22, it says, Love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. Personal story. I got into this exercise stuff and started exercising. And I was trying to help my wife to exercise. <coughs> and she wasn't coming along as fast as I wanted to. And I would, you know, I did, I, I, looking back on it, and then she tells me now, um, I, I didn't become a very pleasant person. Because I was like, did you exercise today? How, you know, how come you haven't exercised and we should exercise more? Never worked. It wasn't until she decided for herself, this is going to be a lifestyle change that she was going to do, that she, she changed. So she's not changing for me. She's changing for herself. 
And that's hard. And I get it. It's hard to look at somebody and you see them, see them making wrong choices. It's hard, it's hard to look at some of your kids and you have to bite your tongue when they come over. And you have to... But you're, see, there's not much you can do now. Just present them grace, love them unconditionally, and pray for them regularly and constantly. God, that person you want to change, because some of you are married and have a lifetime desire to change your spouse. You want to make him like you. Not your job. Ellen White was a prophet, and her husband sometimes ate meat. If the prophet could be gracious, so can we. See, it's not, it's not my job to change other people. It's, it, that's the Holy Spirit's job. My job is to show them an example of what God can do with somebody. I remember getting, I mean, when I got married, I thought things were going to be one way, and and I was insisting on some things. And some of you heard me so, tell this story before. Um, but I, I, you know, I wanted to eat rice and beans. And I wanted to eat rice and beans because I was born in Cuba. And I grew up in Puerto Rico. And that's what we eat. We eat rice and beans in the morning, rice and beans for lunch, and rice and beans in the evening. And if you go to sleep and wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know what you eat? No, you... you you don't eat anything at 3 o'clock in the morning. You go, you go back to bed. <laughs> kind of crazy stuff is that? And I married my wife thinking she was going to do rice and beans for me every single time. And the third day of my marriage, she brought some spaghetti to the house. And I was like, what? No. I had never eaten spaghetti before. I hated it. I hadn't even eaten it, and I hated it. She said, we're going to eat, eat spaghetti. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I, you know, you can eat spaghetti, but I want rice and beans. I want you to cook me some rice and beans. Because my mom and my mom and my mom and my mom. <laughs> and my wife put her hand on her hip. See, when a woman puts her hand on her hip, that's never good. It's, a, it's not like I'm going to put my hand on my hip. Here's 50 bucks. That never happens, right? And she says, so, so she did two things. She put her hand on her hip and called me by my name. That's never good. When a woman, when your mom called you by your name, it, was, it wasn't because you were doing something good, right? And she says, Roger, if you want to eat rice and beans, you can cook it yourself. Because I am not. You said that before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you heard that before. I'm not your mom. And I was like, what? I'd just been married, and I thought I was supposed to be the head of the household. And so I had to assert my authority. So I put my foot down and ate the spaghetti because I was hungry. <laughs> life, church life, would be so much better if you focused on changing yourself versus others. Acceptance precedes transformation. Number three. Third thing we find from this story is this. Here's the third principle. Treat antagonists with respect. But don't stop the party. Meanwhile, the older son, verse 25. The older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing. He asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. In verse 28 says that the older brother became angry and refused to go in. And the father went to meet him, and they had a conversation. Here's, here's what I, what, what I, what I want to tell you on, on this principle. 
if you don't believe the devil exists, try doing evangelism. Try to help your church beco become other-centered. Try to engage your community. Try to awaken the saints. And you get attacked by the devil. Because the devil hates evangelism. And every time people are returning home, there is going to be attacks from without and from within. People telling you, yeah, we've tried it before and it didn't work. Yeah, we tried small groups before. That doesn't work here. That doesn't fly in this church. Yeah, we tried a series and nobody came. The moment you try to do evangelism, the devil is going to put a target on your back and is going to try to destroy you. That's why evangelism needs to be accompanied by an intentional, sustained, permanent prayer strategy. We don't pray so we can go evangelize. We evangelize through our prayers. Prayer is not the prepara preparation for battle. Prayer is the battle. Because the moment you start thinking about, okay, I'm going to do something for God. And after this weekend, you'll be, be encouraged. You have some tools. And you're going to be, you're going to hear some speakers and, 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 and some seminars. You say, maybe, maybe in this church. And, and, and it's, for me, one of the hardest things that I have to do as an evangelist, one of the hardest things I experience on a regular basis is trying to convince Adventists that we should do evangelism. Coming from a Hispanic background, that never used to be the case. We don't vote it in Hispanic churches. We know we're going to do it twice a year, sometimes more. So going through a process where we have to vote it and we have to see if we have the people and we have and all this. See, it, it's hard to go and try to convince Adventists that we must go outside our walls. So the moment... You try to become other-centered and try to do programs that engage your community and try to open up the church to have a food bank so you get names for people that you can give Bible studies to. And the moment you try to be evangelistic and intentional and grace-oriented, there's always going to be somebody from without and from within that's going to criticize you. But don't fall into the trap of letting other people determine the size of your dreams. Sometimes criticism, listen to me, you can tweet these out. Sometimes criticism is just the sandpaper that God uses to polish the work of art that is in you. If nobody is criticizing you, worry about it. So, here, here's somebody, he's upset. I don't know why. Usually in the church, the ones that demand the most contribute the least. The ones that criticize. When I talk to people and I say, yeah, um, okay. No, evangelism doesn't work. I'm like, okay. Um, and that doesn't work. And I'm like, okay, so what, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> You're always going to be criticized. <coughs> Tomorrow night, I'm going to share with you the connection between cause and evangelism because it's a significant one. The landscape of our country is changing. The fastest growing religion in North America are people that don't have any religion. It's one in five. They're called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. So, in order to reach the nuns, most of them are millennials, now the younger kids, this is your sons and your daughters. In order to reach them, you can't change your essence, but sometimes you have to change your methods. And sometimes in the church, we, we think that anything that has to do with change, is this, the change is the same as Jesuit, or change is the same thing as compromise. It's not the same way. My, my wife just came back from a, from a conference uh, and faith-based 
uh, organizations that organize conventions. So she was trained. And Marriott was giving a seminar. And Marriott was saying that they changed the whole branding of their hotels to make it more accessible to millennials. See, Marriott did not start all of a sudden selling cars. They didn't change what they do, but they changed how they did it. They didn't compromise on their mission, but they changed their methods. And every time you do something that's a little different, somebody's going to criticize you. And you have to understand that comes along with the territory. If they're not criticizing you, it's because you're not doing anything significant. Let me share with you something specific. Last year in Atlanta, we organized all the churches. This is Smiley's churches. We organized all the churches and said, okay, in order to reach this community, this big city, we have to be known for more than just the fact that we go to church on Saturday and don't drink coffee. We want to be compassionate people. We want to do acts of compassion in this city. So for 40 days, we did seasonal service in the city of Atlanta, and we changed roofs and changed carpets and cut grass and just minister to people. Okay? And then we did a huge health fair that over 500 non-Adventists came to. And then we had a march against violence in the highest concentration of Hispanics in Atlanta, we marched around it, the perimeter for a mile and a half. There was a thousand Adventists that put on white shirts and had a general conference initiative called End It Now. And we had our signs and we had uh, our little kids in pot finders and uniforms and adventurers and we, wa we walked around. And after and before we did it, there was some, there was some uh, social media criticism about, well, you know, it looks like a political rally. There's not, nothing political about it. It's a spiritual rally. It looks about like a political rally. Uh, they, this is not what we should be supposed it, to. It's, it's criticism and criticism and criticism. But we did it anyway because you can't let the 5,000 hits. A lot of comments from unchurched people that said, I don't know who Adventists are, but this is what churches should be doing. There was a lady that Saturday morning, her boyfriend grabbed her by the hair and grabbed her from the second floor of her house and grabbed her all the way to the, to the first floor by her hair, slashed her tires. And after she saw 900 Adventists marching, she said, well, if you guys are brave enough to do that, I need to talk to the police about my boyfriend. And now she's a solid member in the church. See, when you step outside your comfort zone and do what God is calling you to do, you're always going to have detractors. And one of the things that we fail at is that we try to respond in kind. When somebody criticizes you, pray to them, be respectful, but don't stop the party. Engaging antagonists is like wrestling with a pig. At the end of the day, you both get dirty and the pig likes it. <laughs> you are called to be on mission. There are people in your communities that are prodigals. The God is waiting to send to you. What are you going to do about it? The reason why I do evangelism is because I want to reach as many people as my brother. My brother's a pastor's kid. He's out of the church. He's been gone for 10 years. And I see people coming to my series that are like him. 40% of the people that come to my series are millennials, are young, young people. They're interested religious things. They're sometimes turned off by religious people. But for me, it's personal. I, I want to I reach as many people as I can, like my brother. I want to see my four kids in heaven, and I have four kids. I know it's rare because I'm Hispanic. <laughs> I 
I want to see them in, in heaven. All four of them are millennials. See, when I wake up in the morning, what keeps me up at night is, to, is, is the thought of like going to heaven without my kids. Going to heaven without my, without my brother. So this is personal to me. So I don't have time for the petty f- and the arguments about who has the keys to the kitchen or whether there is cheese in the potluck. I don't have, I have t- I'm not time to argue about dress, diet, and drums. I don't have time to argue and get about fighting about stuff that are non-essentials. I want to be concerned about the people in my community. When fishermen don't fish, they fight. And I love our message. And I'm excited about being a third generation Adventist. But sometimes I wonder if God is not holding back some people to come to our churches because of the infighting and the problems that we have between ourselves. We are here this weekend to make sure we understand that God has called us individually. If nobody else in the church wants to do it, God has called you individually to do what you can in your sphere of influence to share Christ and this message with the world. I want to have a prayer now because as I was praying about this message, <coughs> this is what I heard from God. And I didn't hear an audible voice. I just felt a strong impression. And the voice, the impression in my heart, and, and what I hear God telling me that I want to share with you is this. There might be some of you right now that you are totally committed to doing something for God. But you're encountering resistance. It might be from other members of your church. It might be from your family, it might be from an illness, and, and it seems like, I, say, I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but, but it seems like that the more you committed to doing something for God, the stronger the attacks. And, and, and the moment that you say, okay, yeah, I've been sitting down too long, I need to step it up. That's, that's when a car breaks down and that's where, where the marital conflict starts and that's where the kid gets into trouble at school and, and that's where the financial problems come. And I'm just here to tell you that I want to minister to you. I want to pray over you. So whatever attack is happening in your life, you have to see it as a sign that God's anointing is on your life because whatever God blesses, the devil attacks. If you don't want God to bless you, if you don't want the devil to attack you, tell God not to bless you. Because whatever he blesses, the devil attacks. So I want to pray a prayer of covering over you. I, I, wanna, I want God to smooth out the difficulties you're having at home. Whatever attack that you're having tonight, this is what I wanna, the way I want to end. Hey, treat the people that are against you, the haters in your life, with respect, but don't stop the party. Don't stop your purpose because of others, people's opinions and problems. So I don't know who it is that I was supposed to tell this to, but if you're here and, and, and you're encountering some issues in your life and you want God to minister to you and to pray to you, what I'm going to ask you to do is to stand and come join me here and this, fill this. I know there's not much space here, but there's some space over here and over here. If I'm talking to you, and this is you that's going through some struggles right now, and you're getting hit hard, I want to pray over you so God can tell you once again that he's called you, he will protect you, he will bless you, he will help you. It's his job, not yours. Your job is not to be successful. Your job is to be faithful. And when you're faithful, God brings whatever success at the time that he brings the success. Okay, so your job is to be faithful. Okay, right, one last story now, and I'll pray. I gave Bible studies to a guy. Every time I went to give him a Bible study, he was drunk. He drank a 12-pack of beer every, t- every time before I got there. So I gave him 20 Bible studies, finished the whole thing. At the end of the Bible studies, he was still drinking heavily. 
And he said, you know, I'm not ready to commit. And thank you for giving me Bible studies. And I left that district. And I went back. Okay, this happened 2003. I went back to the camp meeting last year. And this, this little dude came up to me and said, hey, do you recognize me? That's, that's really hard for me to, to answer that question because I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know him from, from Adam. And I said, uh, uh, who, who are you again? He said, you gave me Bible studies. He said, you came to my house and you used to be drunk every time you came. But this year, I've been attending this church and God finally gave me the victory over alcohol. And now I'm a deacon in this church. And he pulled out from his, from his wallet a card with my picture on it that I had given him 12 years before. So I'm saying your job is not to be successful. Your job is to be faithful. And when you're faithful, God in his time is going to work on the, on the life of the people. Okay, You do what you need to do. And let God do what he needs to do. He's on his throne. The devil is not more powerful than God. There are no two similar forces fighting. God is huge and big and fantastic. And the devil is not. He has a big mouth, but he doesn't have that much power. Don't give him more power than he actually has. So rely on the Lord. Trust in him. Do what you need to do. Treat antagonists with respect. But don't stop the party. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. There are people in our communities right now that need you. Some have disconnected from church and need to return. Some have never come. Help us be the types of churches that pursue excellence and intentionality in everything that we do. That when people come, they're inspired by your presence and the fact, the fact that people that are there are passionate about you and not their own personal pet peeves. I want to pray in a specific way of people that are suffering some type of attack, problem, difficulty, it might be a marriage, kids that are disconnecting from you, and it's hard to serve you when all these things are happening around us. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to rely on you and your presence and your grace. And we ask for a special covering and a special anointing that you will surround these people with your spirit, with your angels, and they, if there are some specific attacks that are happening, may they understand there is more with us than with the enemy. May they trust in you. Help open our eyes to the need around us. And when we receive criticism for doing what you called us to do, help us to keep marching forward. Help us to be faithful to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do me a favor, give a hug to the person next to you and say, God bless you. God got your back. And please be seated. <laughs>